We're excited this morning. This morning we have a brother I love that's going to be preaching and sharing the word with us today. It is no other than Damian Drakes. Damian is married to Joy, and they have two wonderful children, Deanna and DJ, and we're so glad to, be, to have them here at United. They have literally, physically, and spiritually helped build this church. Uh, Damien is a deacon. Damien is a trustee. Damien is a minister. Damien has the gift of generosity, and he knows how to share that word in a way that impacts our heart. Would you welcome Damien Drakes today as he shares the word of God with us? Let's go, brother. <laughs> wow. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity. Thank you for, uh, wow, just who you are. Just thank you for the worship team. Thank you for uh, a pastor who has uh, graciously allowed me to take this spot to share the word with your people. So, Father, I pray right now that you just empower me. Lord, I pray that you will speak. Let it not be my words, but your words, Father. Bless those who are here that are struggling, Father, with um, anything, Lord. We know that you can provide it all. So, Lord, help us now to pay attention, not to fall asleep. Lord, let my words and my actions not call somebody to check out, but help them to stay attentive to see what it is that you have to say to them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Reno, can you see if the in-ears are working, just so I can hear myself? If not, it's okay. We'll keep it moving. So, first of all, I want to say I apologize to Sister King. I tried to put a, a, a suit jacket on today. I did wear some slacks for you, Mama King. I did wear some slacks, but I tried. But I, I felt like I'm going to be moving a little bit, just around a little bit. So I wanted to be comfortable, you know. So, and it's the fifth Sunday, so generally that was Youth Sunday back in the day. So just <laughs> pretend it's Youth Sunday, all right? So, so bear with me, right? So w I'm at this place in the season in my life right now where, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm realizing the scriptures are coming even more alive. I'm at a place where... Um, I hear messages, and I'm from, hey, my brother Reef. <laughs> I didn't see you coming there. All right, so look, Reef, if I, if I move too fast, just say, Drake, slow it down. Slow it down. All right. I'm in a place where the word of God, I hear it preached, I hear it taught, and I'm amening it because it's true. And I love hearing it. I love hearing the gospel. I love hearing God proclaimed. I love hearing all of that, right? But then sometimes it's like, okay, every now and then, you know, God will slip something in. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't read that. Oh, I didn't see that. And at this season of my life where things are a little bit different, I need it. Our pastor's been going through a series called Order in the Court. Order in the Court. And he started off the first session with, we don't value the truth. We don't value the truth. And I quote that exactly from him. So when he asked me to teach, I, I was like, okay, cool, Lord. Well, let me know what it is. And probably about uh, three weeks or so, the Lord spoke through one of his messages. It was on part three. If you get a chance, go back and watch part three. And that one was titled, Who Told You You Were Naked? It was on the September the 9th, no, no, September the 15th. He took us all the way back to the fall in Genesis, and he says this, I'm quoting Pope, accepting the truth and understanding what is true, how is the truth, and how is the truth, shape, how is the truth shaping us, right? So we got to allow the truth to speak to us, amen? Sir, give me some water if you don't mind. Okay, great. How is the truth shaping us? So first of all, I love how he unpacked what the truth is, but I want to go head in because that's when the Lord told me, I need you to teach on this topic. I said, okay, let's go. 
Thank you. Give my lovely niece a, 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 a hand. Thank you so much. I was on, on the internet, on social media, and this guy was teaching about speaking, and he said that most people are afraid of the pause. So when you talk, some people say, mm, uh, mm, you know, and they fill in words because they don't want to pause. And they said because pe when you pause, it gives an opportunity for the person, I mean, that, that, that when you're speaking, for them to think about what you said. So I'm going to have some pauses, and it's intentional because I want you to kind of listen to what God is going to be saying, especially through the Word. Amen? Y'all with me? So the thing is, is that we have to understand that truth, right? What truth is. And God's reality is actual. And you're like, okay, Damien, what does that mean? It means he exists in an absolute and ultimate reality, being God and attributes are true and independent of how we perceive or interpret it, right? Also, his existence is infinite, is beyond limits, space, time, human comprehension. He reveals himself through scripture and creation. So I'm going to read that again. God's reality is he, he's actual, infinite existence beyond the limits of time, space, and human comprehension as he reveals himself in scripture and creation. So basically, God's existent, existence is independent of your thoughts of him, your opinions of him, your feelings of him. His reality is not subjected to your personal beliefs. We see that exercise in our day-to-day -day life, right? We see it all the time, right? There is a chair right there. I, there might be one, maybe two people that might argue with me on this, but everybody probably will say, that is a chair, right? That's a chair. We all come to the conclusion that we're going to agree that that is a chair, right? Now, if I take that chair and stand on it to touch that curtain right there, I still might not be tall enough, but if I do that, it does not mean it's a stool. So I cannot redefine the chair as a stool. It's a chair. Another example is a red light. We all know, I'm teaching my son, it's a, a red light is a red light. Stop. That's what it says. You go, you stand before the judge, because there's order in the court. You stand before the judge, you read the red light, he says, you get a ticket and some points. We don't argue truths that we believe, but I want to talk about God, because God is, right? God is powerful. God is knowing. God is present. He's everywhere. God is supreme. God is unchanging. God is holy. God is compassionate. God is gracious. God is faithful. How many of y'all know that God is faithful? He's faithful, right? Faithful. God is transcendent. God is imminent. That means he's here. He's working. He's working right now. Just. God is patient, slow to anger. He's allowing time for repentance. So I, I say slow to anger because he's allowing time for repentance. Okay? There's, you catch that later, right? Exist by himself. He just exists. God has no limits. Everything we have in our time and space has limits to it. I don't care what it is. It has limits, right? God is eternal. He's triune. He's jealous. He desires exclusive devotion and worship to him only, right? He has perfect wisdom. God is good. 
God is incomprehensible. He, he, he possesses a supreme beauty, majestic. He's glorious. God is a creator. God is self-sufficient. God is truthful. God is majestic. God is a provider. And God is a healer. God's a healer. Today's title is God Heals. God Heals. So it's important for us to know this and to understand it, that God, healing doesn't always manifest itself the way you expect it to. Healing doesn't always manifest itself the way you expect it to, to, to happen. See, I just read a whole list of the attributes of God, and if you believe it, because it's true, but if you say you, are, you believe it, then you accept that healing can manifest itself in different ways, and I'm about to show you why. The text, Genesis 2, 15 through 17. I'll give you a second to get there. We're back in the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17 says this. The Lord God, I'm reading for the ERV. The Lord God put the man in the garden of Eden to work the soil and take care of the garden. The Lord God gave him his, this command. You may eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree that gives knowledge about good and evil. If you eat fruit from that tree, on that day you will certainly die. God gave a command. You ask why. Like, why did God do that? Well, we just heard who he is. Because he's God. I think we ask questions sometimes. The answer is there. It's he's God. Like the parent and the child. And the parent says, no, don't touch that. Why? Because I said so. I brought you here, I'll take you out. Like, you know, the, the whole idea is that there's, some, there's, a, there's a certain amount of authority that the parent has been given, and the child has to respect that. So why are we questioning something that is just true? It's what he wanted to do. If you're not okay with that, that's on you. So then what happens next, right? What next? Genesis chapter 3. Start in verse 6. It says this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that the tree desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, and he ate. At this point in God's word, immediately, immediately, spiritual death enters. Physical death begins. Spiritual death immediately happens. Physical death starts to begin. This introduces pain. It introduces brokenness. It introduced, introduces sadness. All of the things that you may say you don't like, that stuff is introduced into the world. Because of all the stuff we said about God, he said that he, we said he was truthful. And if he said, if you eat, you will die. He said it. So it has to happen, and it did. We pick up. In verse 7, before I begin verse 7, at this point, the relationship is now dead. The connection that man had with God is now dead. It's not there anymore. 
So then we pick up in verse 7. It says this. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made, and made themselves coverings. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. Stop right there for a second. So now here, right? Here we know God. One of, one of the main things that God has rocked me off of recently or making me just pay attention to recently is relationship. How he's just big. Everything is built on relationship. Even in the Godhead, there's relationship there. You know, so for us to say that, oh, I don't want to be around nobody, mm, that God, God is a relational God, okay? That's just something that he's woven in because he is like that, like that and he has made us in his image, okay? Y'all with me, right? So now the relationship is severed, so now God is like, I'm going to walk in the garden, right? He's walking in the garden. The Spirit of God is walking in the garden, right? And, the, and, and it's like the sound is there. In the Hebrew, it's like, it says the walking is like moving back and forth. And God says, where are you? Where are you? I know when you were either some adults, right, and you got maybe nieces or nephews, and I just remember playing hide and seek, right? And if you ever play hide and seek with like a two-year-old to five-year-old, right, they really can't hide, right? You know, they'll go and sit in the chair and be like, you can't find me. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're sitting in the chair right there. Like, what are we talking about right now? However, you, you, you play along. You know, you play along. You might even look around. I don't see you. You play, you play along with it, right? Okay? So here it is. G Jesus is saying to you, where are you? Like as if, you know, no, right? Because at this point, the relationship has took a totally different turn. And he's about to introduce seeking man. Seeking man. He's, he's now in the place where he's seeking man. He created man, set everything up cool, man sinned, Relationship is severed, so now he's like, okay, we're at this point in time where now the seeking is going to start. Because in eternity past, there's a plan. This separation, this relationship that's broken has to be fixed. And you ask, why does it have to be fixed? Because he's God. He desires relationship. He's all those things we just read. If not, go back and watch the video, and you can see what I listed. It's all, all of that. He has to be all of that all of the time. He cannot be loving and not be just. He cannot be relational and then not be empowered. Like, he has to be all of that. Y'all with me? Yeah. Okay. So now, with this relationship being severed, right, this has to be fixed. It has to be fixed. That's where we land in John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So now, to restore this relationship, the most important thing is the spiritual part of the relationship. So God started there first. The spiritual relationship is the most important. That's the relationship that needs mending. That's the relationship that needs to be put back together. That's the relationship that needs to be healed. So God's act of healing began spiritually. The gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God set up a plan for this healing to work. Because he's, he's true to who he is. He said it would have to die. The sin has to be paid for. 
So now we all come from Adam, the Bible says. We all come from Adam, so we all have that sin that Adam had. So God uses the cross. He uses a form of punishment so that the payment could be paid for. Some people call this the great exchange, right? The great exchange. Hear me out. I don't know if you've ever been in this position before, but your bank account is negative. Your bank account is negative. Wells Fargo, you pull up the app, it says negative $10,000. Hold up. Hold, let's go worse than that. A negative $100,000. Negative. The first thing you're going to ask is, how did they let me get $100,000 negative? <laughs> That's not the point. It's negative. You did some things that you wasn't supposed to do, and it's negative, because this is my illustration. There's a negative balance. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, Jesus comes along and he brings the balance to zero. Some people call that imputation. That's where the credit, Jesus credits to your account. Your balance is now zero. Zero. Amen, right? 100,000, more than that, right, right? It's zero, right? Okay, cool. You stay with me, right? But that's not it, right? Then we jump into justification where he transfers a million dollars to you too. So now, spiritually, not only are you not negative, but you also got enormous amount of money that you could just spend. That's the righteousness that God has put on you. So now when you pull up your app on your phone for your bank account and you show everybody you got money. <laughs> so what you should be displaying is this righteousness. So when God looks down, the father looks and he sees that. He's like, oh, you got money. It's what Jesus put there for you because of his blood he shed on the cross for you. Those who believe in that. The caveat, it don't cost you anything but belief. Like I said, you should be on after that point of believing. You should be on display at that point. You should be on display. You should be excited that you got money. It's been paid. You're going around, you're going to tell somebody, look, guess what? It was a negative, and you're, going to, you're not embarrassed. At that point, there's no embarrassment. Hey, I was negative $1,355,700. And guess what? It got paid, and then they gave me the money too. Where are you? Are you excited about that great exchange? Are you excited? First Peter 3.18 says this. In the ERV says this, Christ himself suffered when he died for you. And with that one death, he paid for your sins. He was not guilty, but he died for people who are guilty. I told you my illustration, you did it. He did this to bring all of you to, to God. In, the, in his physical form, he was killed, but he was made alive by the Spirit. The great exchange. Those of us who believe this, we've been healed. Remember that. If you believe on the cross that Jesus Christ died and that he rose, you've been healed. Period. That's it. Now, that just leaves physically. Just leaves physically, right? Because we got to understand that the body now is corrupt. 
the physical body is corrupt. The spirit man was made alive, but the body is corrupt. I'll tell y'all a little story, so stay with me, right? My beautiful wife, wife is right there. My parents are over there. Hey, mom and dad, right? <laughs> Shout out to them. I'll tell y'all a little story, right? And it's interesting because as I was going through this message, I think of uh, God and how he's providential and how he's sovereign, how he's sovereign and he does every single thing for a reason. And, 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 and as I go through this testimony, right, really think through how does God operate, right? So me and my wife, beautiful wife, got married in 2010. And around 2012, because uh, so, we, we were like, you know what, we're not going to have kids for the first few. No, we're going to just enjoy each other and, you know what I mean, just live it up, you know, the married life, two years, right? So around 2012, my, my wife has a twin sister, her name is April. 2012, Nala was born, my niece, Nala. And then also Micah, Micah was born, my sister, right? Micah's my niece, my sister had Micah. All right, stay with me. <laughs> So at that point, you know, Joy and I was like, okay, let's do this. Let's get one, all right? And I asked Joy as we were reflecting on this, and, and she told me, she says, I remember when Jocelyn, my cousin Jocelyn, um, and Jocelyn had a baby too around at the time, right? So it was Jocelyn, and my cousin Jocelyn is a little older than me, okay? So I'm not going to tell you how old she is, but she's a little older than me, and I'm 50. So sorry, Jocelyn, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> So she had a baby. My sister, who is two years younger than me, she had a baby. And then also uh, Joy's sister had a baby. So, of course, it was baby fever that was going on at that time. So Jocelyn and, and Sayeri both, uh, and my wife says, use this words, they were uh, big and pregnant. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They were big and pregnant, and they started rubbing their belly on her belly, like to, to, trans, like to transfer a baby into her stomach, right? So she remembers that, right? So this is around 2012, and we, we, we were trying to work it out. We were trying to figure it out, right? No lats to try in, you know what I mean? And, I, and, and, and it sounds good to say it, right? Oh, we're gonna, we, let's try to have a baby. Let's do this, right? And most guys would be like, yeah, let's get it. Like, let's do it, right? <laughs> but to be on a schedule, like, it's just not cool. But you got to check ovulation dates, you know, all this other crazy stuff, right? So then it's like, all right, cool, you know, can't do it now. We got to wait till next week or this week or tomorrow and blah, 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 blah. It, it, it's just interesting, right? So that's 2013, working on it, right? Then all of a sudden, right, 2015, two years, she got pregnant. She got pregnant, right? Cool. We, at this time, we were at United because we were at United since around 2012. So we at United, came and told Pope and Myra, they were excited for us, told our parents, you know what I mean, we were excited. And this is my first time really going through this part of the process. So I was like, yo, yeah, 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 that's what's up, Reap, yeah, got a baby on the way, woo, woo, woo. You know, that kind of conversation, right? And then, early 2015, she had a miscarriage. That was crazy. I mean, what women go through is crazy. I mean, sorry, I'm going to go there, blood everywhere, and they were like, look, so you had two options, you can pass the baby naturally, you know, or you can go and get this thing called a DNC, right, where the doctors go in and do what they do, right, so me and her was like, mm, still hope, I was still hopeful, you know what I mean, the doctors and everything was like, nah, 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 I was still hopeful, I was like, nah, nah, we ain't going to do that, we ain't going to do that, so then when the miscarriage actually happened, I'm like, this is crazy. So one night, it was going down. I ended up snatching her up because she was in such pain. Went to the hospital. They put her on some morphine, and she, got, she was able to relax, and that was a crazy ordeal, right? So, of course, we trust in God through it all. That was 2015. Right after that, we bought our new house up the street. So now we're in a new house, and then at that time, around that time, I find out that I got a daughter. She's 16 years old. What? So Nay comes into our life in the midst of all of these uh, 
times of trying, she comes. So you naturally can know how that can make possibly Joy feel, as well as me. And I'm like, oh, this is crazy. So she accepts Nay, and we, we're, we're, we're working through all of this stuff. And then around 2016, my daughter gets pregnant with my grandson, and we'd start fertility treatments. We were like, you know what? Let's make this happen. I was like, all right, babe, whatever you want. Let's just do it, right? So we started exploring the process. When I found out what the process actually was, I was like, oh, man, he's trying to go through all this. But she wanted to do it, so I was like, okay, let's go, right? Outside of that, we had to cut a check. We're talking thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. <laughs> cut a check, fertility treatments, and she gets pregnant. Okay, all right, all right, well, it's, it's an investment, you know, okay, cool. It's an investment. But in May 2016, she has a miscarriage. Now, I'm still traumatized by the first one. She probably was, too. So we like, nah, we ain't riding this one out. We're going to go to the doctor and DNC. You know, it's a struggle when you think about your faith. But when you've been through it again, it's like, nah, uh, uh let's, let's go. So she goes. In August of 2016, my grandson is born. So in May, we lose a baby. In August, we gain a grandson. God is able, right? Yeah. Okay. We stopped the treatments in 2016 in June because I'm like, we ain't spending no more money. It is what it is. We're going to keep it moving, you know. And we started to just enjoy, between 2018 and 2020, just God is enough. We just enjoying, you know, whatever God is doing in our lives at the time and spending our money on going to Mexico and other places and not thinking about baby clothes and nurseries and none of that kind of stuff, right? Or saving for college, none of that, right? So between 2018 and 2020, God is enough. So one of the things I want, want you to realize is that, and I have it written down here, suffering can serve a purpose in our lives, even if we don't fully understand it. Sometimes God uses our trials to draw us closer to him or teach us valuable lessons. And I got to share this because we just came back from the men's retreat and it was dope. But I had a moment where I was talking to Pastor Pope's brother and we got a chance. Uh, the brothers got a chance. No, wait. The men got a chance, which is brothers, got to see these two brothers sit up there and a answer godly questions with the Bible. So it was amazing. Right. So Pastor Pope's brother comes up to me at the end and he asked me how I'm doing. And I said, I'm doing, I'm doing good. I'm, you know, I'm hanging in there, you know, chilling, loving God, blah, 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 blah. He was like, oh, okay, dope. And I said, pray for me because I have to teach on Sunday. He said, what you teaching about? And I said, I'm teaching on healing. He's like, I thought your back was, was, was messed up. And I was like, it is messed up, but he's a healer. You know what I mean? So because some of y'all know about six months ago, I couldn't even stand up straight. You know, I would go in the grocery store and have to get a cart and lean on the cart. And now I have so much respect for seniors that are leaning on the cart because I understand, I understand, right? I mean, I was walking and my cousin was like, yo, stand up. And I was like, yo, I can't, you know? So he was just like, yo, that's crazy because you're going to teach in your pain. You're teaching in your pain. I was like, absolutely. I said, because he's that good. So then he begins to tell me, he was like, look, he says, look, one of the things that I'm so enamored about God is how he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Yeah. And he says, he says, I got to a place in my walk where I needed to grow more and understand more about God. So he made my son sick. And he said, he told, this is what he told me. He says, he said, that's when God says, you know how I feel. It's not punishment, but it's just love. So he wasn't saying it in a negative sense. He was just like, that's love. 
We do things, experiences, and trials so that it will display his glory and how Pastor Post's brother is just walking with God through this whole, his whole family is through this ordeal about their, their nephew and son. So I say, God, you're enough. Read it again, emphasizing that suffering can serve a purpose in our lives, even if we don't fully understand it. Sometimes God uses our trials to draw us closer to him to teach us a valuable lesson. So in March of 2020, she gets pregnant again. We ain't trying, we having fun. And, and I'm like, oh, no, here we go. Because I'm not thinking full term at all. I mean, I ain't going to lie to you. I was just thinking, like, oh, here we go. You know what I mean? Here we go. So I can't remember if it was before the DNC or after the DNC. But me and my wife, she comes to me and she says, hey, you got to have to have a vasectomy. And I said, you got to get your tubes tied. Uh-uh. <laughs> And I'm like, she's like, why not? That's selfish of you. And I'm like, that's selfish of you. Why would you want, you know what I'm saying, me? Like, no. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, I don't want, that. Oh, don't put no scissors, nothing. You know what I mean? I'm good. I said, we'll figure it out. But no, uh-uh, I ain't, that ain't happening. So, you know, we got over it. We kept going, went to Mexico a couple of times. We was just chilling, right? So after that, at 48 years old, 12 years later, 12 years later, she come to me and say, I'm pregnant. And of course, I was like, here we go again. Guess you're going to get them tubes top now, you know. <laughs> but nope. I mean, the ex you could, when we were going to see the sonogram, we were going to see it, and the look that was on us was like, all right, let's get this over with. You know what I mean? Tell us that, oh, you're, it's supposed to be nine weeks and it was six weeks and blah, 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 blah. All the stuff that they tell you, you know, we're just waiting. And then all of a sudden we hear, do, 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 do. I was like, oh, snap. Okay. What are you doing? I said, Lord, I'm 48. Not interested. <laughs> Keeping it 100. Keeping it 100. Not interested. Right? I got it. At this time, my grandson, my grandson is probably, was probably at the time maybe about six or seven. You know what I'm saying? And we could just give him back to his mother. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we've been through part of that process. You know what I mean? Um, but, you know, as time went on, it was, he, he was still there. He didn't go anywhere. I said, oh, her belly starts to get bigger. And then it gets to like maybe like the seventh month or something like that. At some point, it's like, oh, if the baby come now, it's, it's premature and it's all, it, you, got, you got the rest of your life now. It's a wrap. And I was like, okay, this is actually happening, Lord. And in October of 2022, little DJ right there, except, huh? December, not October, December. I don't forgot my son's birthday. December. <laughs> December, he was born. Christmas baby. So now I got to get gifts for his birthday and Christmas, right? And my wife's birthday is right around the same time. My sister's birthday is around the same time. You know, but I guess my purpose for telling y'all this is miracles happen. Miracles do happen. So first of all, God heals us spiritually. And then if he so desires for his will, he will heal us physically. Which leads me to my verse in John. Chapter 9. And we're going to read it in the ERV, if y'all don't mind. While Jesus was walking, he saw a man who had been blind since the time he was born. Jesus' followers asked him, teachers, why was this man born blind? Whose sin made it happen? 
Was it his own sin or was it the sin of his parents? And isn't it just like us when we see something that's not wrong with our health or somebody, we start blaming who or what we did? What if? What if? Let's see what happens. Jesus answered, it, is, it was not the sin of any, it was not the sin of this man or his parents that caused him to be blind. He was born blind so that he could be used to show what great things God can do. Come on, y'all. What if your sickness and things that you're struggling with has nothing to do with your upbringing, your parents, or even what you did. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's us. You know, if you eat too much pizza and sugar, and then the the doctor says you're pre-diabetic, okay. (laughs) Happens. But what if all of this happens so that God can just do a good thing? so that God can express all of his attributes as he always does, does, but he wants to do it through you. And what if you walk around, I'm talking to believers, what if you walk around as you are healed because you believe in the cross? That your spiritual healing is more important than your physical healing. What if? you adopted that attitude, then maybe when death comes to your door physically, you can smile and say, I'm going to be with the Father. My my brother Tucson, who who I love dearly, was in a car with us, and he was sharing with Ron and some of the rest of us about when his mom who knew Jesus, passed away, was ready. Was ready. He said he, and he said he, he wants to be like that. What an example. What if her suffering was necessary so her son would see how he ought to be when it's time for him to see the Lord? Mm. Let's keep reading. The Bible says this. I'm going to start in three again. Jesus answered, it was not the, any sin of the, this man or his parents that caused him to be blind. He was born blind so that he could be used to show what great things God can do. While it is daytime, we must continue to doing the work of the one who sent me. The night is coming and no one can work at night. While I am in the world... While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After Jesus said this, he spit on the dirt, made some mud, and put it on the man's eyes. Jesus told him to go wash in the pool of Shalom. Shalom pool. <laughs> so the man went to the pool, washed, and came back. He was now able to see. This is this man's process. Of, he, of physical healing. That was his process, okay? Your process might be different. That was Joy and I testimony and our family's testimony. It may not be yours. But as a believer, we all have the same spiritual healing testimony. We all have that testimony that God healed us Jesus paid the price for our sin, and now righteousness has been accredited to us. That's us now. We're healed. The physical part will come. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, in New King James 42 through 44, says this. So also in the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, and is raised in power. It is sown natural, it's sown in a natural body, and is raised in a spiritual body. This is a natural body, this is a natural body, 
and there is a spiritual body. So believe me, God will fix it. At one point, you're going to have a glorified body. I can't remember if it was Pope, but somebody said, yeah, I, I want to be able to fly, you know what I mean? So who knows what the glorified body will enable us to do. Definitely allow us to be able to worship the king. So that which the pain that you're feeling now is temporary. The, the, when, when, when my sister said that when it rains, it's a little cloudy, and I don't know if she was lending to arthritis, but the other day when I woke up and, and I was taking the, uh, the baby to, taking the baby to daycare, right, <laughs> which is expensive, but I was taking the baby to daycare and I was sitting on the step and, and my wife says, you okay? And I said, it's raining outside. And she was like, oh, yeah, so, so you in pain? I said, yeah, the arthritis. Arthur, Arthur got me. <laughs> but, I, but, but I rest in the fact that God will heal all of that physical part. So my encouragement to you all today is just remember he's a healer. He's a healer. The Bible does say that we ought to come to one another with our prayers and that we can be healed. Faith can heal you. But don't get it twisted. You've already been healed. So there's the spiritual and there's the physical. So even if you pray and it doesn't seem that like it's happening, at least give it 12 years. (laughs) At least give it 12 years and prepare yourself at 50 years old chasing a little boy around saying, dinosaur. So the AV team has a song that they're going to play. And just trust God. Renino told me this. I was telling him I was struggling with the with, with ending. And he said, he said these words. He is able. That's it. That's all you have to remember about the God we serve. Everything I said, all the attributes, the characteristics, all of the scriptures we read, if you leave out of here and you just remember he's able, you'll be good. So they're going to play a song. Thank you guys for allowing me to share with you what God has laid on my heart. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the fact that you're a healer how you have rigged it in such a way that your sovereignty displays itself in our life so that we can trust you more, learn from you lessons, and that we would be given the strength to endure. Father, thank you for the fact that Paul tells us there's a thorn that you had given him that will constantly remind him that he is human. (laughs) Lord, some of us are dealing with physical pain and, and, and things hurt, Lord, and some people's pocket hurts and some people relationships are tattered, Lord, and I just pray that today, Lord, that they leave here knowing that you are able, that they will give it to you, that they would focus on the plan that you had laid out for all of us through the word of God, the love letters of the Father (laughs) about the Son to us. Thank you. Thank you for the illustrations in our life that that reflect your character, how you desire a relationship, how you walked in the garden and played (laughs) hide and seek to us who were not worthy. Lord, you're so good. You're amazing. Bless your people now, Father. As they hear this song, let their hearts respond to you. And bless those that are online, Father. Those who are dealing with family issues, those who are dealing with financial issues, and those who are not feeling well. I do pray for Miss uh, Cynthia. I know she's not feeling well. She's not here today. And I pray for her. I know you can heal her. Let her come back next week with a testimony of how you healed her physically. Lord, we're grateful and we're thankful. Bless the rest of our time in this day. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.